tell me a story about a time when the school faced a challenge um, or, or someone in the school faced a particularly big, big challenge and the school came out better for it in the end. Let's think about COVID because that seems ah, pretty, pretty recent. That's a big one. <laughs> um, COVID, when your entire program is based on human connection, COVID and lockdown was a really big time for us. Mm -hmm. um, and also that, I guess that plays into your questions about government requirements as well, right. because there's still requirements to offer curriculum and support to our young people while being in lockdown. I think the period where we were in full lockdown was only a term, so it was only mm. 10 weeks, but it was a really quick pivot for everyone mm. in Queensland that had came really suddenly and it was really interesting to watch. So schools, not uh, state schools, mainstream schools, uh, had a couple of weeks to pivot and they produced ridiculous amounts of work and content and was sending home these thick workbooks and like you're going to be online for like eight hours a day or there's even longer <laughs> than the school day but you know whatever I mean like look online and log in and there's going to be classes and you've got to keep up with all of these things and we went for a completely different model obviously we went for connection and compassion and knowing that lots of our families were in crisis they were right. suddenly thrust into environments where many had lost their jobs, lost their incomes. There were many who were trying to balance full-time work from home with full-time mm. care for their children. Um, there were lots of people who were first responders who were mm. having to do the work and, and try and manage schooling. And so we just said, look, we are here for you. We will provide all of these range of experiences and options that will be fairly optional and we will we will hold space for when your little people return to us anything that's needed we will look at then it's not it's not a crisis if for six weeks they just play with their brother and lego that's really not a it's a lovely thing but we also knew that our communities really needed connection they needed mm -hmm. to and for some of them they needed us to be there so we weren't as technology driven at, at mm. the time we became quickly website coders and able to get online and we did um, we made sure that our program we had things every day where the kids could connect socially mm. they could jump on their computer and they could join in a we had a pet circle that was really fun so they'd put their pet up to the camera and be like, it's my turtle or here's my guinea pig and like right. share that. We had a joke circle. So they just hop on and tell jokes to each other and share and connect. We had people who would teach us would just read novels online and people would just mm. lie there and listen and just chatting things as well as work things that they could do on their own and lots of options for like, here's all the art galleries in the world, Let website links, yeah. go and explore <laughs> an art gallery. We had stacks of things that they could do offline because we were really conscious that we didn't want everyone to just live on screens because now that we're at home, right. we've all got to live on screen. So we're like, here's a million things you could do with sticks and leaves in your backyard, or here's a mm. million things you could do. Um, and we provided, because we had to provide curriculum, I was working in little kids, so sort of five to seven-year-olds, we provided like maybe 10 to 12 tasks a, a week that were play-based, but still mm. rich and deep. And that could be done at different levels and people could log on and share those or send emails or use the online platform. So we used Google Classrooms. Mm -hmm. the, the, the big shift was that I hadn't worked in Google Classrooms. Lots of us hadn't worked in Google Classrooms. We hadn't um, built websites. We hadn't done a lot of online work and we had to pivot and put this whole system together in two, three weeks, which is everyone was doing that. Everyone was scrambling, right. but we were scrambling in a way that we had to re retain our heart and our connection and our play and and we had to make it really diverse for individuals to dive in and out mm. of, of different levels so there were some families that it was really easy to do that stuff and some families who will or not we were literally delivering laptops to families who mm. didn't have computers and and technology and knocking on doors and then running away and waving <laughs> from the car to the little people so that they could connect online if mm. if they didn't have that and we um, I think we did a really, really good job. It was a mm. really huge learning curve. I had my own, kids were quite little, so I had my own three kids at home trying to do that, their own stuff and play and not fight. And I'm trying to also teach online. And then I was in at school three or four days a week with the kids whose parents were first responders who had mm. had to be able to go to school. And that was weird too. So like, we went from mm. a community of like 100 to like really different dynamics, not having their best friends there, but just oh, being yeah. like, 
there's like six kids here and we had a great time. We did cooking every day and had a good time, <laughs> but I didn't tell my kids that. I was like, no, it's really boring at school. Stay home. Right. <laughs> sometimes they came with me. Um, so that was a crisis point. And yeah. like many crisis points, it's a time to dig in deep and go, what's essential? Mm. What do we value? And how do we not let this crisis and challenge rock those deep philosophical values? How do we let those philosophical values give us strength in this time of challenge? So I, I guess that's an overarching message of challenge for, for us as a community is that when stuff gets hard and it gets hard a lot, we need to pair back to what do we value and and how can those big ideas, which do, as you say, they do seem fluffy, you know, happy children <laughs> and learning and blah, but, but they can also really pull you through to go, if what we're doing isn't hitting this big stuff, then what's the point? Mm-hmm. You know, find find a solution that actually sustains those big goals, and the solutions will, even if they're hard, will mm-hmm. come will come to you, and and will be worth it. You know, if mm-hmm. if you can get through the challenge by going, as long as the kids are happy and they're learning, we're good. That's our that's our pine motto: is happy children learn. And it's like we value mm-hmm. both of those equally. And, and we really did in that time stretch ourselves. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's mm-hmm. a story. Um, so, yeah. so I'm curious if, like, has – are there aspects of that that you've retained? Like, it, yes. That, yes. Yeah, cool. I think it's absolutely changed our culture in a positive way because mm-hmm. we are much better at using technology and flexibility and um, we're all really good now at going, oh, well, I can – do a Google classroom chat about that, Mm. or I can use an online tool. Um, I think we had a staff who maybe weren't as good at thinking outside the box with technology. And so they've become better at that. Mm. Um, Our students certainly have been able to take that as a tool for themselves. Like my, um, our older kids will build a website about practically anything and be Mm. like, Oh, that's fine. Or open a little, um, yeah. Google chat for something or Google meet. And yeah, so I think that that aspect of just the f- practical logistics was really good. And I think also we were better for it by knowing deep in our hearts that whatever learning isn't there doesn't matter as long as we can prioritize connections so that when those kids came back, we weren't the people going, Oh my gosh, they've lost a year and they <laughs> yeah. don't know their times tables. We're like, <gasps> We're so happy to see you. Let's just play together and we'll get to those time tables. They'll come. Right. And they did. You know, right. those right. kids, exactly. they got back on track. If yeah, there is a track. That, that's one of the things yeah. that I, I have have been trying to articulate. Like, how do you help people see that? that I mean, just that that essence right there of like, happy kids will learn. Yes. And, and, and put it in a way that sort of says, yes, you can, you know, it, it's not entirely illegitimate to have concerns about, you know, things they may have missed out on. Absolutely. But it's also like, but if you, if you, if you structure the situation right, they're going to have the initiative and the, and the, and the, the ability to come out on the other end with, with, you know, like, like, Yes, there may be an interruption, but it's an interruption. It's not a failure. It's not a, you know. Yeah, life is long. Life is a long yeah, time. Yeah. They'll get where they need to go. Where, but if they're happy, they'll, yeah, they'll take it on board for themselves to fix yeah. the things that they need or to change the things that they need to change. Yeah, yeah. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr.